Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to, I believe it's episode 155 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name, as always, is Larry Erickson. And as always, for the next half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur, going on about things that are interest to me and that I think are worthy of your attention. If you have any reactions to the show, comments, questions, whatever, you can email them to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there if you prefer. Uh, As always, if you do email me, please include something in the subject line so I know it's not spam, and uh, be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm a little slow about dealing with email. All right, with those uh, introductions out of the way, let's get to it. Now, I always like to start, whenever I can, with some bits of good news, and I've got a couple of bits of good news this week. Um, First one relates to a common theme of good news of late, which is same-sex marriage. On April 14th, District Court Judge Timothy Black ordered the state of Ohio to recognize the marriages of same-sex couples who were legally married in other states. Ohio thus joins Oregon, Kentucky, and Tennessee as states that have been uh, ordered by federal courts to recognize legal out-of-state same-sex marriages. Black said the Ohio ban on recognizing such marriages is unconstitutional and unenforceable. Now, this doesn't mean that same-sex couples can get married in Ohio. This, uh, that, that was not an issue before the court. What it means is that such couples who were married legally in another state before they moved to Ohio are still married after they do. Uh, They will have the same privileges and benefits and rights enjoyed by opposite-sex couples. Now, the context of this case is a little bit different than a lot of the others. It involved four uh, four same-sex couples, three of them female, one of them male, Uh, All of them had been legally married in other states before coming to Ohio. Now, the female couples had each conceived a child through artificial insemination. Uh, The male couple had adopted a child who was from Ohio. Each of these couples wanted to have both names listed as parents on that child's birth certificate. Uh, Ohio refused to do it because it won't recognize these people as being married. Well, under Black's order, these couples will get their wishes. Black held off on whether or not to stay the effect of his order in order to give both sides a chance to argue about whether or not he should stay it pending appeal. But he did say that he was inclined to allow his ruling to take effect for the particular four people, four couples rather, who uh, brought the original suit. Black was blistering in his ruling, saying that the ban had been enacted, quote, with discriminatory animus and without a single legitimate justification. He also wrote that the ban embodies an unequivocal, purposeful, and uh, and explicitly discriminatory classification, singling out same-sex couples alone for disrespect of their out-of-state marriages and denial of their fundamental liberties, And he labeled the already moldy argument that the court should respect the voters' wishes even where fundamental rights are concerned. He called that argument specious and said the supposed state interests involved are vague, speculative, and or unsubstantiated. In my favorite passage of this, Black wrote that, quote, the record before this court is staggeringly devoid of any legitimate justification for the state's ongoing arbitrary discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. So there's good news there. Now, actually, there's another bit of good news, uh, also relating to same-sex marriage, uh, that comes from Indiana's neighbor, comes from, uh, comes from rather from Ohio's neighbor, Indiana. Uh, on April 10th, There, Federal District Court Judge Richard Young granted an emergency request to force Indiana to immediately recognize the marriage of a lesbian couple who were married in Massachusetts. The judge issued a temporary restraining order, which is good for 28 days, uh, in order to allow time to schedule a uh, a hearing on a restraining order, on on an injunction on this. What that means is legally now, at least for those 28 days, uh, Amy Sandler and Nikki Kwanzi, Kwasney rather, are married. Now, the ruling could be overturned, 
But Young found that the couple had met the requirements for an emergency order uh, for emergency relief, and there is a reasonable expectation, reasonable likelihood, that they will prevail in their overall suit. Now, the reason for the emergency order, however, is that this is actually a good news, bad news kind of thing. Uh, Nikki Kwasny is terminally ill with ovarian cancer. Uh, the concern here is being able to access federal and state safety, safety nets, help benefits, assistance for surviving spouses and children. Now, the state argued that Indiana's marriage law does not allow for hardship exemptions and, get this, get this, argued that if the law changes after Kwasney died, thus validating the marriage, the state could then change her death certificate. So Indiana, the state that is here arguing against recognition of a single marriage, the state that bans same-sex marriage only by statute and but despite what is happening in the rest of the country and a good part of the world is actually now moving to try to have it banned by constitutional amendment, this state is now grandly allowing as how if at some point in an unknowable future which the state hopes will never come same-sex marriage is legal in indiana well they can deal with this issue then long after they must be by the very meaning of their own arguments hoping uh, that this will be long after everyone involved is already dead and so the whole point is moot indiana the state that would make birch by roll over in his grave if it wasn't for the fact he's not dead. This case is actually part of five suits in Indiana against its ban on same-sex marriages that have been consolidated under Judge Young. Uh, proponents of, of marriage equality, of marriage justice, took heart from the judge's ruling in this case uh, because they think it may indicate his thinking on the overall broader issues involved. The thing is, however, ultimately all this, this whole issue is going to wind up in the lap of the Supreme Court. It's unlikely that all of the courts of appeal that are now involved in appeals from district court rulings in five different states will all rule the same way, which ultimately means it's going to be up to uh, Johnny Roberts and the Supremes in order to make a final resolution. Which actually leaves me with just two things to say for now both of which, in fact, I have said before. One, Antonin Scalia has seen his dissent from the decision throwing out Central Parks, uh, parts of the grossly misnamed Defense of Marriage Act. He's seen his dissent from that quoted at least twice in these cases uh, in decisions upholding marriage equality. Uh, and it will be fun to see him try to figure out a way when this case is actually before the Supreme Court to figure a way in order to deny the meaning of his own words. And two, no matter what the outcome of these cases at any level of the judiciary up to and including the Supreme Court, this remains true. Justice is coming. All right, the other bit of good news I have here actually is more good news. This comes out of New York City. In 2002, the, the NYPD established what it called the Demographics Unit. What this unit did in the name of counterterrorism was, in short, it spied on Muslims. Not only in New York City, but also well beyond, even in fact outside the state of New York. The unit was conceived with the help of a CIA agent working with the NYPD, and it assembled databases on where Muslims lived, shot, worked, and prayed. Plainclothes officers infiltrated Muslim student groups, put informants in mosques, monitored sermons, and cataloged Muslims who adopted Americanized surnames. They eavesdropped on conversations in restaurants and bookstores. They monitored Muslim social media activity, their websites, their blogs. They watched community centers, businesses, and even elementary schools. This went on for years, even after it was exposed in a Pulitzer Prize winning series on this by the Associated Press. It continues despite the blatant bigotry and the bottom line concept that the Muslim community is the place to look for, to quote, budding terrorist plots. In fact, a deposition, and a deposition related to a suit against the program, Assistant Police Chief Thomas Galati, 
described how police gathered information on people even without any evidence of wrongdoing based solely on their ethnicity or their native language. And you know what all of this produced? All of this spying produced? Nothing. Not a single thing. In that same deposition, Gulati said that in the six years he had been commanding officer of the NYPD's intelligence division, the demographics unit had not produced a single lead or started a single terrorism investigation. Not one. Those two things together, blatant bigotry and a fantastic failure, led on April 15th to the only good news that had come out of an abomination like this. The program has been shut down and the unit has been disbanded. But even here, I have to add, hold the applause. Remember, I told you last week that one of the ways that the spooks managed to spy and keep on spying despite being caught out at it is that they change some names, shuffle some papers, and then say, oh, well, that old bad program, that's all gone away now, while continuing to do essentially the same thing under a new name. So what we need here to be satisfied, or more accurately, reasonably reassured, is a flat-out statement that the NYPD will no longer spy on, no longer surveil any individual, community, location, or organization without actual suspicion of wrongdoing, and that the information gathered by the demographics unit, which, by the way, had already been renamed the Zone Assessment Unit, remember what I said about just changing names, that the information gathered by this unit has been destroyed, including any copies of that information that may have been distributed to other agencies or units. In other words, no loopholes. Because as one leader in the Muslim community in New York put it, quoting him, the concern wasn't just about the fact that this data was, was being collected secretly, it was about the fact that this data was being collected at all. The good news is that the NYPD has been forced to react to the pressure. Now it's necessary to make sure that reaction is more than just words. Now, talking about spying and spook spying uh, it brings us to one of our regular weekly features. It's the outrage of the week. Okay, you've heard about, I'm sure, about this recently revealed heart bleed bug. This is the one that threatens a significant portion of the internet because it targets a vulnerability in OpenSSL, which is the most uncommon encryption software used by websites to secure their data, including, including their, their, their users' data. Estimates are that about two-thirds of all websites, including an equal portion of the largest and most heavily traveled websites, um, use OpenSSL. Major websites have been spending sleepless nights trying to come up with patches, uh, and users have been advised to change their passwords. All of this in an attempt to block or at very least limit the potential damage. Because unlike all of those, the internet is crashing emails you've been getting from your Aunt Harriet for the past several years. This is no joke. This is no hoax. This is very real and very serious. So yes, change your passwords. And in fact, seriously consider limiting any future possible exposure by, um, uh, by limiting how much personal information you actually put out there on the internet. And frankly, where there is an alternative, don't shop online with a credit card. Don't bank online. If you have to order something, do it by mail order. Okay, that, all that's the scary part. Here is the outrage part. According to a report by Bloomberg News, the NSA has known about this security flaw for, for two years and has told no one about it. Instead, the agency kept the information to itself and used it for its own purposes. Quoting the Bloomberg report, this is a quote, Putting the heart bleed bug in its arsenal, the NSA was able to obtain passwords and other basic data that are the building blocks of the sophisticated hacking operations at the core of its mission, but at a cost. Millions, I in fact would say tens of millions, of ordinary users were left vulnerable to attack from other nations' intelligence arms and criminal hackers. Now, this bug, the Heartbleed bug, was actually created accidentally uh, around 2012 by a minor adjustment in the protocols of OpenSSL. 
the NSA, which has more than a thousand experts whose job it is to ferret out and exploit exactly these kind of vulnerabilities, found Heartbleed shortly after its accidental introduction and made it a basic part of the agency's toolkit for stealing account passwords and otherwise penetrating accounts and stealing information, in other words, spying and leaving no trace because one of the deep problems with Heartbleed is that it's very difficult to even know if your site has been attacked. Now I have to admit here, I have to admit that the NSA, after first uh, refusing to comment, has flat out denied, uh, flat out denied uh, knowing any single little thing about Heartbleed before it was revealed by a private security report. But the fact is, through the papers that were re released by Edward Snowden, we've known at least since last September that the NSA, together with British intelligence, had already successfully cracked the encryption of most of the internet. And that, as I already said, a basic function of the agency is to find and exploit these kind of security holes. But the spooks deny it. So here's what I have to decide. Who am I going to trust? Who am I going to believe? A respected news organization or the NSA? Gee, what a toughie. Let's take a break. Here we are back. Uh, all right, now our next thing up here is we have an occasional feature here. Uh, this is when something in a news article gets little or no comment. It's just sort of passed by without comment. But I think it's important or revealing or sometimes just annoying. We call it the little thing. Now, recently, the Tennessee legislature passed a bill uh, claiming to, quote, protect religious liberty, unquote, in public schools. Uh, this passed overwhelmingly. They passed the state house by 90 to 2 and the state senate by 32 to nothing. The bill says that student organized religious exercises, such as student prayer groups and, and uh, religious clubs, will have the same access to school facilities as any other non curricular group, without, as far as I'm aware, anybody claiming that they can't do that now. The bill then says, and I'm quoting the bill here. A student may express beliefs about religion and homework, artwork, and other written and oral assignments free from discrimination based on the religious content of their submissions. A student would not be penalized or rewarded on account of the religious content of the student's work." Unquote. Now, the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, says that the law encourages religious coercion and would allow students to express their religious beliefs in a variety of inappropriate settings from the classroom to school day assemblies and school events. In other words, you're saying the law is less about protecting religious liberty than it is about establishing a religious tyranny of the majority. A particular concern of opponents of the law is that it opens the door to rampant uh, anti-gay, anti-LGBT uh, bullying and discrimination under the guise of religious freedom. Now all of that is true, and all of that is more than enough reason to condemn the measure as another attempt by the right-wing wackos, particularly the right-wing religious wackos, to force their own biases, their own right-wing religious fundamentalist wacko ideas into the civil law. But this is the little thing. And uh, maybe, you, maybe you noticed it. Maybe you noticed something other people seem to have not caught. It lies in the last sentence of that part of the law that I quoted. I'm going to repeat it. A student would not be penalized or rewarded on account of the religious content of the student's work. Do these people even think about the meaning of what they're saying, of what they're writing in these laws? By this law... A student could go to a science class studying geology and claim, based on their religious belief, that the Earth is only 6,000 years old and they could not be marked down. They could turn a biology paper saying that evolution doesn't exist and their grade could not be lowered. They could declare the sun revolves around the Earth and it could make no difference in their grade. They could go to history class and insist on the, re on, on the reality of Noah's Ark. They could argue that slavery is morally acceptable, that women should be submissive to men, and that gays and lesbians should be stoned to death, and none of it could matter. 
Apparently, Tennessee, still ticked off that John Scopes did not wind up in prison, has now decided that religious liberty involves students in public schools in their state being able to ignore the unpleasant facts of modern knowledge. Because like the man in the play said, fanaticism and ignorance is forever busy and needs feeding. And Tennessee is ready to open up a buffet. All right, moving on from there to our other regular weekly feature, it's the Clown Award, given as always for meritorious stupidity. This week, the Big Red Nose goes to the administration of South Fayette High School in McDonald, Pennsylvania. Christian Stanfield is a 15-year-old boy who suffers from comprehensive delay and anxiety disorders as well as ADHD. What that means is that he can grasp things, but it takes some time. He's slow to grasp things, and more particularly, he has a low mental processing speed, which means not only does he take time to understand things, but he does everything slowly. He had been in a special education class at South Fayette High School, where he's a sophomore. He had been getting harassed and bullied by other students in the class, up to and including having books slammed against his head. His mother, Shay Love is her name, she contacted the school several times about the bullying to no avail. Finally, Christian got tired of it, so he used his, he used his iPad to make a seven-minute recording of the bullying, which he played for his mother. She went and confronted the school officials with the evidence. The response of school principal Scott Milburn was to call the police and accuse Christian of felony wiretapping. A city cop named Robert Curta questioned Christian, and he said, based solely on what the principal told him, he charged Christian with disorderly conduct, which is, as a local attorney there said, a catch-all for disposing of a case. In other words, disorderly conduct is what cops charge you with when they want to charge you with something and they have no idea what that could be. School officials demanded Christian destroy the recording and punished him with Saturday detention. To make this even more absurd, South Fayette District Judge Maureen McGraw Desmond upheld the disorderly conduct charge and fined Christian $25 in court costs. And by the way, the students who were tormenting Christian, nothing happened to them, nothing at all. So a student is being harassed and bullied. His mother repeatedly notifies the school. Nothing is done. The student records the bullying and the school is presented with the evidence. As a result, the lame brain school wants him charged with a felony. The lame brain cop charges him with the disorderly conduct and the lame brain judge convicts him. All while the actual, actual guilty parties here walk without so much as a bad look. So the South Fayette High School, in fact, in fact, no, not just that. Everybody involved here in McDonald, Pennsylvania, the school, the police, the courts, you are all of you clowns. All right, we're going to wrap up today with something I, uh, 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 something from last week. I talked last week about, the, about this. Uh, UPS had fired a 25-year uh, uh, employee at its distribution center in Queens in New York City over a time card dispute. This violated the union contract, which barred such firings without a hearing. In response, 250 of his co-workers went on a 90-minute work stoppage protest, which I frankly refuse to call a strike because, I mean, 90 minutes? That's like a long lunch. I mean, these guys, these drivers, probably spend more time tied up in New York City traffic in a given day. But the UP UPS responded by firing all 250 workers for their supposedly illegal action. That, I said last week, was evidence of how UPS is not on your side and you shouldn't be on theirs. Well, here's the update. UPS has agreed to rescind the firings. All 250 workers, plus the one fired over the car dispute, uh, have their jobs back. And that has been the headline in the coverage, usually phrased as some variation of UPS agrees, almost like the company just said, hey, you know, yeah, sure, what the heck, forget about it, come on back, everything's fine. This result has been cheered as a victory for working class New Yorkers and the result of an inspiring, relentless campaign. However... 
It should be noted that this may not have come as the result of the union's relentless campaign, at least not directly. UPS had been adamant about the firings, refusing to budge until after Letitia James, who happens to head the Office of the Public Advocate for the City of New York, wrote to UPS to remind it that the company has contracts with the State of New York worth $43 million, including $2 million in contracts with New York City, and it gets other perks, including, very significantly, a virtual exemption from parking tickets from the city that saves UPS millions of dollars every year, and which she didn't say because she didn't have to, an exemption that could be revoked at any time. Well, as someone commented, apparently UPS realized it did not have the authority to fire New York City officials. So at this point, UPS goes, oh, sure, we can work something out with the union. Sure, fine. Which in turn raises something else, something that at least for me casts a pall over the celebrations. The something that was worked out between UPS and the union involves more than the workers getting their jobs back. Yes, they did get their jobs back, but they will, each and every one of them, face a 10-day unpaid suspension. And the union will pay UPS some kind of damages or penalty for the lost productive time. So let's summarize what happened here. Okay, at the start, UPS fires an employee in violation of its union contract. Other workers object to this with a 90-minute protest. At the end of this, all 250 of those workers face 10 days loss of pay, and the union will pay UPS some money, while, while the cost to UPS for violating the union contract is zero. This is what we are now supposed to regard as a victory. This is how bad it's gotten. This is how far it's fallen. This is how much ground we have to recover when we're supposed to celebrate because people who actually remember what a union is supposed to be, people who actually care about solidarity and their fellow workers, we're supposed to celebrate to declare victory because those people only lost 10 days pay. Last week in talking about this, I said, there, uh, said that there is a fundamental divide in the U.S. And the important thing to hear is to know which side you are on and to be prepared to stand there. A case like this points to that divide and highlights it. Fact is, I know which side I'm on. I'm on the side of those workers. If you want to be on the side of UPS, I can't stop you. But you should do it knowing damn well that while you may be on UPS's side, UPS is not on yours. That's it for this week. We're going to get out of here. I will see you next week. In the meantime, have the best week you possibly can. And peace.